Man, that is so cool to be in and out of a deal with like such little invested and make six six thousand dollars. And the other thing I love about it is uh, is no marketing expense, right? Since it was a Fizbo off of Zillow. This video is brought to you by Flipster, the nation's largest property database, including houses on the MLS and off market leads like pre foreclosures and vacant homes. To find your next wholesale or fix and flip deal, start your free trial today at joinflipster.com. Really great to have you, Paul. Thank you for joining us on this interview. You're in the St. Louis market. And yes, um, real quickly, a background, and then we'll have you kind of share a little bit of your story. But you had mentioned that you got started in 2018, mm -hmm. but it took two full years until you got that first deal. From that first deal to today now, you've done about 16 deals, right? Mm -hmm. And I love something you shared with me, which is you were watching the YouTube channel. I did this interview with Richard Taylor. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys remember that. We'll put a link if you didn't, but a really fascinating interview, young guy. And he talked about how he's having a lot of success with Fizbo for sale by owner. And he shared a little bit about that. And then you took that to heart. You, you, you took mm -hmm. that information and then you went out and did a bunch of FISBO deals, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just love that because you're you're learning, you're gathering information, and that's meaningless unless you take action, which is what you did. You took massive action and then mm -hmm. landed some FISBO deals. We're actually going to break down the most recent one you did. So that's really, really awesome. But, but Brian, why don't you go ahead and introduce us? Tell us a little bit more about that backstory of getting started. You had mentioned that it was, you, you'd said I had failed for two years. Um, interesting, interesting way to look at it. Tell us why you looked at it that way and why it took the two years, what you think was the, I don't know, the missing thing or what happened to then have success. Um, so the first two years, uh, when I first learned about wholesaling, it was basically, I was just, I actually started doing for sale by owner, but we was just making such horrible offers that it just never like materialized into anything. And my first year, uh, we did have contracts, but we didn't get anything closed. Mm. So that's that's why. Uh, I mean, in the second year, it was kind of we had a way better understanding of what we were doing. And um, the first year, we actually got one contract that was supposed to close, and they just didn't show up to the title company. And um, that was kind of the first. Oh, that's year. frustrating. Yeah. yeah, that 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 almost made me, you know consider other options, but <laughs> I stuck it out and um, I got my first deal in 2020 and it was just a crazy year. So that must have been challenging. I mean, you you work so hard at the business and learning and you had a couple contracts, they fall through. Mm -hmm. What what was it that that made you keep going and not be like, okay, well, this doesn't work. I'm going to go do something else. How did you stick through it with all of that? I didn't just want to, you know, quit too early because I seen so many people make money in real estate. So uh, if that was my way in, I knew that I had to just figure it out somehow. And yeah, so it, it just worked out. Yeah, that's great. And so you got that first deal in 2020. Fast mm -hmm. forward about two years and you've done from then till now about 16 deals. So is it starting to feel like now it's clicking? You're getting a groove. You're getting some processes in place what's what's different from that first deal to now today um just experience with knowing how to talk to sellers and something that we're pivoting like huge on now is a lot of on market offers and i feel like in my first two years you know cold calling these lists i wasn't talking to motivated people so i really wasn't making offers and something that i deal with now we making you know 25 offers a day to agents listings and so it's just it's so different from, you know, how I even view a deal now than how I did, you know, two years ago. It's just, it's just uh, the mindset shift and, you know, working with agents is just super different than just grinding out off market all day. So I'm definitely open to uh, agent, you know, deals now. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, if you know me, I'm a really big fan of, of agents for leads because, when you build those relationships, it can turn into repeat business, you know, and it's just, uh, it can be a really powerful way to, to generate leads. So that's, that's exciting. That's awesome. And 25, I mean, that's, that's really making a lot of offers. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when you're making that many offers and talking to that many agents, just everything's in your favor because you just you're creating so much momentum that deals are going to come just because you're putting out you're you're putting in your inputting so the output's going to happen just naturally, you know. So that's exciting, good for you. But let's mm-hmm. take a minute now and break down this uh, most recent deal. It was a for sale by owner, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I love to do kind of like the anatomy of the deal and really try to understand what it is that, how you found it, how you put it together, how you found your buyer and in each step along the way. So this one was a for sale by owner on Zillow, correct? Yep. So tell us about that. How, what were you doing to find that FISBO? How are you, how are you looking for those first of all? Um, I would just take a certain amount of time every day to uh, get on Zillow. And that's pretty much my favorite uh, site to find for sale by owners. So um, that zip code that was, you know, the house was in is actually a zip code that I actually live in. And so I always try to just keep a you know close eye because it is a hot area as well. <clears throat> and um, basically the house was listed for a hundred thousand. Uh, it was a kind of a gross tenant in the house. She didn't want to be a landlord anymore. And um, the house had been sitting, I think, for I think over three weeks on Zillow for sale by owner. So I actually texted her and told her that I could buy a sub too. And that's kind of how I kind of disqualify all the, you know, ways that she felt or the options that she felt she had if she just wanted to be done with it. Yeah. And so when we came up with the number, uh, we actually had seen the property before I made a like a concrete offer. And once we seen it, it was so much worse than she had thought it was because she hadn't seen the house in three years and the tenants were. It was vacant. Oh, I had a tenant. Yeah. The tenants were just, it was just a a not smelling good house. Like it it was not a clean house and the tenants were kind of getting over. They was paying like $300 under market rent and she was just done with it. And after we looked at the house. I actually had a buyer look at the house with me who I've done a deal with in St. Louis. So we already were kind of crunching numbers and um, we got the property under contract for 78,000 and we ended up selling the house for 85,000, but we had to pay some like, uh, I think she had sewer fees or something. So I had to pay a little bit out of my fee. And that was uh, like a $6,000 deal. And basically it was, like it took no time, honestly. I seen it once and then that was it. Yeah. So let's talk about those FISBOs for a second. So you guys that uh, if you haven't looked for FISBOs like on Zillow, um, one thing that you have to think about is when you do your search in like your zip code, mm-hmm. what Zillow does, and they're actually in some lawsuits over this because they it's uh there's a lot of there's a lot of argument that it's um Oh, I guess discriminating against the public because what they've done is they've done two tabs. So when you look, you run your search, right? And you've got your map on the left with all your dots, your red dots. And then on the right-hand side, it gives you like the data breakdown and some filters and stuff. And so there's two tabs at the top. One is like agent. So these would be listed with real estate agents. And then the, and then there's another tab that's called other, I think it's called other and that's where it could be like uh, for sale by owner, or it might be like, um, you know, pre foreclosures coming up to auction or just non agent type of listings. And so it's very deceiving because if you don't know, you won't really notice that tab and you won't see it. Um, now, this is something again that's in a lawsuit over whether or not that should be, they should be separated like that because most people don't know to look there. So make sure you click on that and and that's where you can find Fizbo's is on that tab there. And then usually it'll have the the owner's contact info. Sometimes they won't put their like phone number on there and you'll have to contact them through the form. But you know, some of those for sale by owners can be distressed properties. So that's kind of what you're looking for and then you reach out to that homeowner. Right? So um so that's what you did, right? You found it on that tab, the other tab, and then contacted that. Yeah. Contacted yeah. that owner directly. She so contacted that owner directly. You then, what's that? Yeah. I texted her. Okay. You texted her, made contact, and then you went out and looked at that property. You brought mm-hmm. your cash buyer. Was your cash, that cash buyer, the eventual buyer for it? Yes. I only showed okay. it to one buyer and um, okay. she lived 40 minutes from the house. So it was like, it was real. It was, it was a lot of things that, 
she didn't really want to deal with. Um, she lived 40 minutes away, the tenants. She didn't want to be a landlord anymore. And um, mm. I think she was like a full time nurse. So she she was working like eight to 10 hours a day. And now, it was, this, yeah. so the seller that had these tenants, mm. when you wholesaled it, did the tenants have to get out or did the buyer buy it with the tenants? Yeah. So that was the thing as well that kind of held the deal up. Um, the tenants, they didn't move out during the time frame that we gave them. <laughs> so when closing came, you know, I had to be the bad guy saying, you know, possibly you're going to lose everything else that's in the house because we've already closed the property. And, you know, so um, once I told them that they just, you know, they were saying that they were going to get the stuff out, but they didn't get anything out. They didn't get the stuff that they left you know, past the time frame. And so they, they left, but they didn't clean it out. No, it was definitely wasn't cleaned up. Okay. <laughs> well, so, you know, if you're, if you use uh, like my contract, um, mm -hmm. I've actually got language in my contract that talks about if the, if they're, if they're going to leave it room swept clean, or if you're going to go ahead and agree to take it with whatever debris is left over. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing to, to kind of get really clear on because, um, it can turn into thousands of dollars. And so cash buyers, they know, hey, if I got a big trash out and I got to do, you know, five dumpsters and a crew to trash out a house, that could be three, four thousand dollars or whatever. Right. So um, now in this case, it's a little tricky because it's not really the seller who has control over it. It's the tenants. Mm -hmm. But um, even still, like I'll tell a seller with tenants, I'll say, hey, are we factoring in a trash out or are these tenants going to leave this place clean? And if they leave it clean, then here's a number. If they don't leave it clean and there's a huge mess and I got to trash it out, that's fine. I'll do it. No problem. But I'm going to need a little bit of a discount to pay for that because we didn't build that into our price. Mm -hmm. And so it be, I can, uh, you can use that as a negotiating thing, you know, with your seller. So just keep that in mind when you're dealing with like a messy, either a messy tenant or a messy seller, is there needs to be a conversation around how to handle that. Yeah, these messy tenants, they finally get out. Did did them getting out delay your closing or were they at least out of the house by closing? Yeah, they were out by closing. Okay, but, good. Um, yeah, the rules, like what we put in the contract where they, they were supposed to be out 48 hours before, but they were out the day of closing. So it just okay. kind of- Okay, but they left it a mess. Your mm -hmm. cash buyer went with it. He was okay with it. So he he managed the, obviously he would handle the trash out from that point on. Mm -hmm. uh, but this could have, it didn't, but this could have come back to bite you because what your cash buyer could have said is he could have said, hey, Paul, man, this house is a, this house is a mess. I got to trash it out and then come back on you and mm -hmm. said, hey, I need a couple thousand dollar discount. That's happened. You know, so, so be aware of that possibly happening. Um, okay, good. So he didn't though, and he bought the house. So that was a, how much was that? A 6K wholesale? Yeah, that was a $6,000 hotel. Bill. Okay. So the other thing I want to talk about a little bit here is the way you approached your cash buyer. So uh, there's kind of two trains of thought that people do with cash buyers. One is I'm going to build this big list and then I'm going to be non-biased towards my cash buyers. Meaning Here's my deal. All cash buyers, highest price gets the deal. You go look at it and you try to get everyone to bid and you try to get the highest price to come forward. And um, this is a model that my friend uh, Cody Hoffheim does really, really well. So he's got like this nine or 10,000 person list. He never sells the, to the same buyer twice because what the idea here is I want to find an outlier that will pay more than everybody else. And so he basically says, here's when it, here's when I'm showing it. Here's a window of time. Everybody come look at it, create like a, like a auction environment, you know, like a frenzy type thing. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and highest, here's, here's my asking price, but the highest price gets the deal. And your bid is due tomorrow at noon, you know, after the showing or whatever. And then what happens is, is he tends to get someone that overpays. Um, and he, he calls working with a cash buyer, like in a relationship, he calls it being a cash buyer employee, meaning you now work for the cash buyer. They're going to beat you up on price and you're probably not going to sell it for the highest price the market will give you for your deal. So that's one mindset. And there's something to be said about it. 
The other mindset is more of a very strong relationship driven cash buyer list, which is like what you, you did. Mm-hmm. And this is uh this is, Hey, I need a small list of, you know, a dozen cash buyers that are active. I know what they want. I find deals that fit exactly their criteria, their area. And then I work exclusively with them on deals. What's nice about that is first of all, you don't need a big list. Second mm-hmm. of all, um, you can do like you did and do one phone call, talk to your cash buyer who, you know, will want that deal and you get your deal done. It actually came, I posted it from Facebook, but um, the guy who bought it, we had did deals together and he just texted me and said, hey, what do you got in 63116? And then he just went to see it and then it was just, that was it. Yeah. So it kind of fell into place more than, Mm -hmm. more than intentional. So you did market it on Facebook though? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened to be a repeat buyer reached out to you. We've actually wholesaled a few deals together. That was the first deal he bought from me as a cash buyer, but I knew he his company has done really well in the last year. So I knew he was you know, growing his uh, renovating business. So fix and flip business. So it just, I, I trusted him to get the deal done and he came through. Yeah. And he came through. Awesome. Yeah. So, so that was great. So you just, you did, he reached out, he was interested. You took him over to the house. You walked it. Now you walked it with him before having your contract. So that way he gave you hmm. like his number. Is that how you did it? Um, the seller wanted us to see the house and she wanted to verify the condition because I was telling her, you know, our offer is based on a condition and she sent me pictures that was, I think a year and a half old. So I was just saying, you know, I need to see the house before I could, you know, give you a concrete number. But when we seen that house, um, it had a high mortgage and she just wanted out of her mortgage. So, and she said that I just wanted 5,000. But once we seen the house, she said, I don't have to get anything because I didn't know the house was in this you know, bad of condition and it just worked out perfectly. So that motivation was just like, man, I'm, I don't, I'm tired of these tenants. I'm tired of this property. I just want out. Mm -hmm. And by you offering her to just get out and pay off that mortgage, Mm -hmm. um, it worked and she was fine to just get out of that deal. So classic motivated seller. That's a tired landlord all day long right there. She was Uh, very easy to work with. Yeah. And tired landlords are some of my favorite leads because again, I love having a conversation with another investor about a deal versus a homeowner because with a homeowner, you also bring all the emotional side of it. And with a tired landlord, it's just business. Like it's just, I'm done. I want out. You can cut straight to the numbers. You can tell them, look, here's why the condition comps. You can have a conversation like that with a, with a landlord that you just can't have quite the same with a, with a homeowner. Right. So then once you closed it, uh, you did your assignment, you got your check and everybody, everybody won. Everybody was happy. Seller mm-hmm. got out of a deal. They didn't want anymore. You made six K cash buyer got a, got a deal. Do mm-hmm. you think looking back now that you could have gotten more for that deal or are you, you feel like six K was a good, a good number? Uh, yeah, I, I think I could have gotten more because doing my agent outreach, um, we're making a lot of offers in that zip code now. And an agent told me that a house like uh, I think it was three blocks away went over asking around 20000 So mm-hmm. someone paid 160000 from basically the ARV. I thought it was from, you know, 120 to 140. Someone bought a house for 160 in the same zip code. So it was like I definitely probably left something on the table, but it's I really didn't know, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, you never can rear view mirror when you wholesale. Like you just take your take your wins, take your fees and move on on to the next deal. Mm-hmm. And so congratulations, though, Paul. It's awesome. Guys, leave a comment and say, Paul, you're a flipping genius. Really cool that you did that. How much time do you think you had invested in that deal total? Um, I don't think more than an hour. It was yeah. like just everything fell together. Her, yeah, I texted her and then we seen it and then from the first time I seen it, the buyer had to go see it a few more times, but I didn't go with him. We, you know, we already had all the paperwork. I just told him that, you know, yeah, whatever he needed to go do, just do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And that is so cool to be in and out of a deal with like such little invested and make six, six thousand dollars And the other thing I love about it is, uh, is no marketing expense, right? Since it was a FISBO off of Zillow, didn't mm-hmm. cost you anything. You're not spending money in, in leads and in marketing, you know, cold calling or direct mail or any of those things, it's zero marketing. So that's fun too. It definitely makes me 
you know, just think different in terms of how hard I need to work for deals because, you know, I, I listen to your podcast literally uh, so much and your MLS strategy is just, you know, from me doing the uh, off market grind, you know, just finding agents who have stuff or just, you know, going on Zillow, finding stuff. It's just, it's just a, just a different process, honestly, completely. It definitely simplifies the game. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely simplifies the game because there's so much less moving parts, mm. you know, to put deals together. So love that. Yeah. Well, way to take action. That's awesome. And what's next for you? What are your big goals for the rest of this year? What are you hoping to accomplish? What I plan to do is just really go full force into MLS, agent outreach, double dipping, you know, and take my company to, you know, 30 to 40, 50 thousand dollars a month in profit. And from there, I just want to just grow my uh brand and the amount of deals I do, the the size deals I do, you know, I want to take a $6,000 deal to a $60,000 deal yeah. and, you know, be like you. Yeah. Good. You know, it's the spreads. You think the spread, there's something about the spreads, but really it's a mindset and about, um, you know, getting, de- getting steeper discounts. And when you believe that and you make a new minimum profit threshold, like let's say you just said minimum I'm going to make on a deal is 15,000. And then you go into your deals and your offers that way. All it means is you make, you make steeper discounts, but it's amazing how maybe you do fewer deals, but you'll find that you get, you just get more offers accepted. Whereas before you didn't think you could get them that steep. And now you are. And really the difference is just confidence and it's just a mindset around, you know, being worthy of or deserving of those discounts and those bigger spreads. Mm. Yeah, it really, really is mindset. Yeah, I'm definitely working on my mindset now and just just starting a business. Pretty much everyone told you to not work with agents. So that's just something that I'm constantly getting over. Just, you know, I did, uh, I think, 15 agent outreaches today so far. So. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to just keep my numbers up and just, you know, make offers and do the uh, outreaches as well to just build the relationships of constant lead flow. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Well, good for you. 